I'll begin with thanking uh, Carl Friedrich and Laurie for the invitation. Um, this has come at a good time for me to give this talk, which you'll, I'll explain shortly. So, um, I promise that's the only uh, egregious use of fonts. <laughs> Um, but um, I was inspired by the, the posters that, you know, it's kind of Victorian posters for carnivals, you know, and, and, and extravagant claims. So, um, uh, standard oracle boilerplate, um, if anybody makes a purchasing decision based on this talk, you need your head examining. Um, okay, so um, my goal in this talk is to give... Um, uh, an overview of the history of virtual machines, the design and implementation from the very early days right through to the present, and do that in a way that tries to put the various ideas and the systems in context. Um, let me take a little survey of the audience, because I'm not entirely sure exactly the level of expertise in the room, but we, I have some leading questions that will indicate things. So who? Uh, raise your hands if you have worked before this time on the internals of a virtual machine. Okay, so that's, okay, so we, let, let's, let's flip that. Raise your hands if you haven't. <sighs> okay, so a reasonable number of people who ha don't have internal VM experience. That's good, because I'm going to introduce uh, a bunch of terminology and concepts, and the rest of you can kind of, you know, catch up on your sleep for those parts, <laughs> uh, especially Cliff, who's going to need it. Um, <laughs> Um, so, um, I'm assuming that you know what a virtual machine is and that you've used one and that you're familiar with languages, at least one language that uses one, but I'm not assuming anything about the knowledge of the internal, something that you wouldn't have come across just through use. Now, this is only 90 minutes. This is already a fairly big field, and so I can't cover everything there is in a lot of detail. It's just... Uh, not possible in the time, and I've had to take some um, editorial decisions uh, to make this fit, and indeed we will see if it does fit um, in the next hour and a half. Um, so I'm not covering, for example, garbage collection at all, really. Um, there is a... Is Richard here? He will be. He will be. Okay, so there is a perfectly good... Uh, well, Tony is here. Tony, I saw you around here somewhere. Um, so... Um, so there's a great book on the subject that's very scholarly and with lots of detail and, you know, there's nothing I can add to that really, um, other than gossip. Um, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't want that to be on YouTube. Um, so I'm going to skip that part and I'm going to skip um, background material from closely related fields that isn't directly sort of connected to this. So, you know, compi the compilers is a much bigger field than virtual machines, I think. Uh, and there's a lot of compiler history. Uh, but I'm not going to cover all of the, that stuff other than where it sort of impinges on um, virtual machine stuff. Okay. So the, ba the background for this is um, last year I was invited uh, to teach a graduate class at UC Berkeley on virtual machines. And um, that happened in the fall of 2015. Uh, its code name is CS294-113, nice memorable uh, string. Um, it's called, the, the course is called Virtual Machines and Managed Runtimes, and um, this is uh, a lot of the material in this talk is abstracted out of that course. That was a full graduate class, uh, 45 hours worth of material. Uh, most of it's on YouTube, except we f where we forgot to turn the camera on. Um, there are slides, um, exercises, other materials. The coursework, if you want to attempt to try and take this class, was m most people took 200 hours uh, to complete the coursework. So, uh, and, and, the, pro and the, the point of that course was to get people to build a non-trivial virtual machine from scratch, knowing you know, only sort of standard graduate level computer science knowledge, not any machine internals. And, and we designed a, uh, a simple introductory language, implemented that in two different ways and with lots of different um, features and optimizations. So the typical performance difference between the first version and the last version was about somewhere between 100 and 500. So there were lots of clever speed ups added over the naive thing that you could implement uh, without any knowledge. Um, I also had guest appearances from uh, a number of uh, notable people in the field, including Cliff here, 
and uh, Carl Friedrich, uh, some of these names you might recognize, and if you don't know them now, you will by the end of this talk. Um, and I had 20-odd uh, people take the course and finish it um, and uh, uh, successfully. So it went pretty well. If you want more information, by all means, go find the videos and the material. The videos are just, you know, webcam pointed at me while I'm talking, so don't expect uh, high production quality or anything, but the, the basic material is there. Um, so, um, I said this is going to be a history. Uh, you should always be cautious when somebody says that because, um, uh, you know, I, I don't make any um, absolute claims on truth here. All, all I'm trying to do is report what I've seen and read. Uh, and of course, you know, I, I have to go to primary sources too in many cases. Uh, there are some areas of this field where I've been very closely involved and know some of the people who've been doing the thing, so I think I have a little bit more accurate perspective there. Um, but it is a very subjective kind of thing. Um, and uh, for sure, something in here is wrong. Uh, it's just I don't know what. That's your job to find what's wrong. Um, who am I? Uh, so I work at Oracle. Uh, my job title is architect, which is... Uh, fairly bland. Uh, I used to be at Sun before Oracle was acquired as a, a less bland job title. Uh, distinguished engineer. I've been mostly, uh, I've been, so I've joined Sun Labs in 1993. Uh, I've been mostly in a research in that time. I've had occasional forays into product development and had uh, associations and involvements with various products. Um, I got into virtual machines when I was a master's student at Manchester, uh, mostly by accident. Uh, and it turned out that that was a good time to get started because there wasn't much around at the time. You could kind of find everything there was to read and read it, and then, you know, next week you'd do something different. Um, so it, I've been fortunate to, to work with and interact with many of the pioneers and see, uh, see many of the interesting things that have happened. So that's what I'm trying to distill out for you in this talk. Oh, and feel free to ask questions as we go along. So let's give a, let's start with some background. This is all easy stuff and hopefully unsurprising. Um, the first thing I'm gonna mention is this book by uh, Jim Smith and uh, Ravi Nair, which is a pretty good book of, uh, on terminology and uh, uh, conceptual stuff, but it doesn't really get you very far if, if you wanna build anything, because uh, it's not a hands-on kind of guide. Um, but I use, I, I borrow some of their tem terminology and notation, and then I'll mention, if, if you really want to become expert in this field, you have to read a bunch of papers. You can't stick with textbooks other than for garbage collection. You can get a long way with the, uh, with the Jones, Hosking, Moss, but, but, um, but otherwise you have to read papers. And I'll point out uh, the papers as we go along, the, the, the ones to start with anyway. Um, hopefully this picture is unsurprising. Um, but it gives me an opportunity to introduce some terminology. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to say that a virtual machine is a piece of software that sits on some kind of a host system and implements a guest system, uh, usually some kind of instruction set architecture. So there's two important in interface boundaries here, the guest ISA and the host ISA. Occasionally I'll call these the native and virtual. Um, there, are, there are various different terminals bits of terminology used in the field, and I'll lapse, um, but that's not in any way deliberate. Um, so what, but what is this thing? Okay, so you've got the, the box picture, what is it? So it's, it's a software implementation of a machine architecture, because it's virtual, it has to be in software. Um, now to run software, you need hardware, so, so kind of the hardware is implied too, there has to be some hardware in the picture if anything's going to happen. You have the two architectures, the guest and the host architecture, which could, under certain circumstances, actually be the same architecture. And we'll look at some systems in which they are and why you might want to do that. And the guest could be either something that was created purely in software by the virtual machine that has no hardware embodiment anywhere in the world, or it could be something that already has a hardware embodiment and the, and the, the software is just pretending to be like the hardware. Um, either of those is possible. Uh, the host is usually hardware some, uh, or hardware mediated with a little bit of system software, but it need not be. It could be another virtual machine. Um, so you could be running 
for example, a virtual machine written in Java on top of the JVM, and then we've got two virtual machines in the picture stacked up. <laughs> okay. I wondered if it was an editorial comment. Okay. So the typical VM, um, what you probably think of mostly looks more like this, which is you have some kind of application running on top of uh, the virtual machine and hardware below, and, um, and that's all that there is in the picture. So, um, uh, but, but there are, there are many other um, possibilities, and we'll cover some of those. Um, one of the things looking at the program is I don't think there's anything on the program about system VMs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about system VMs to give some background. And um, well, let's start with some terminology. So if you look in the Smith book, uh, that classifies the world uh, firstly into two distinctions, a process VM and a system VM. And the idea is that a process VM implements an application binary interface. So it's the, it's the combination of uh, usually a machine instruction set and an OS system call interface that an application would be compiled against. So that's an ABI. And if a VM provides uh, an interface that looks like an ABI to run one thing, an application above it, then it's a process VM. Uh, the distinction uh, with system VM is that the system VM just implements a hardware ISA. The sys you, typically the user and the privileged ISA and pretends to be a machine. So uh, in that case, uh, in this case, the, the, the OS sits below the boundary, and in this case, the OS sits above the boundary. So an OS runs on top of a system VM, but the process VM has an OS underneath it, typically. So all, all of the, it, almost everything I say has an exception to it, <laughs> but um, that's generally the case. Now, uh, what you're probably more familiar with as uh, VM users in this era is, the, uh, is a language VM which is a, a, a process VM designed for a specific language, specific programming language. So the canonical example of the day is the Java VM. It, it runs an application. The application has to be in Java or pretend to be in Java. Um, but it runs a particular set of things. You know, you can't just run arbitrary binaries on it. It has to be stuff that was designed uh, to run uh, in Java. And uh, so, but the VM presents a kind of OS-like interface to the application, either directly the underlying OS or more typically uh, a veneer which wraps the OS in some kind of abstraction that makes it more language friendly. Uh, and typically we'll have some kind of an instruction set architecture that's designed specifically for the semantics of that language, that's tailored uh, for the language and hence is uh, perhaps easier to implement or has higher performance or um, you know, is more in natural in some, for some sense of that word. Now, at this point, I would like to introduce the picture that you've been given, uh, which I'm calling the timeline. And the reason you have a paper copy is because if you put this on the screen, you can't read any of it. Not, not a word, not even on a 4K monitor uh, at full resolution. It's just too, too difficult. So I figured a, a paper version was the best uh, thing to, to hand out. So this is a timeline of uh, landmarks in VM history that I've selected to tell the story that I'm going to tell. Uh, I've tried to cover the things that are important. Almost certainly I've missed something and we can have some spirited debates over a pint of beer as to what I've missed and why its significance is or, you, or there may be people in the room who see things on this picture and go, what was the significance of that? Um, and, and we can have that discussion. And I'm, you know, and I won't defend it to the death. It's, a, it's, a, you know, it, it's changing kind of on a daily basis as I've been working on the talk. So uh, I could believe there are more changes due. Um, if you look at the picture, um, the top two thirds uh, of the picture describes uh, systems and publications, which are the landmarks, and the bottom third are languages which are there for context. So it's not an attempt to be, provide a history of all the languages in the world. It's just kind of what was going on at the time to inform what's going on in the, in the top half. 
Um, so if we look at kind of if you look at it from a distance, it looks kind of like this. Right at the top, there is oh you can hardly see that on the screen. Okay. Can you see anything? I'm going to wave. Um, so right at the top, down to about here, across the whole chart, um, those are the system VMs. Then in this little wedge here uh, are live process VMs and some other rather peculiar beasts that don't really fit anywhere else. Uh, God, you can't see that. Yeah, there we go. So that's the, that's the weird stuff, uh, binary translators and emulators and things like that. Then uh, the bulk of our time will be spent talking about this middle section here, which is the language VMs, and then right at the bottom here for the context, historical context of the languages. And uh, what I'm going to do is, rather than just march left to right across this, is I'm going to pick an area, go some distance, and then switch to a different area where I think it makes sense. And to give you a, a map of the, the landscape, I'm going to start with system VMs over in prehistory, work through till roughly the middle of this picture, then switch to language VMs, bring them up to about here, then switch back to system VMs and back to language VMs. Because I think there's some interesting uh, transfers of ideas taking place between the various fields, and I want to I draw on those. And also, it's hard to talk, you know, like all computer science things, you have to talk about it before you can talk about it, because you know, otherwise you end up de defining your terms recursively. OK. All right, so let's start. What are we doing? So system VMs, uh, and I pick this because it's the oldest. Uh, what is a system VM? As I said, it's a VM that implements a complete hardware software interface, uh, user and privileged ISAs typically and hence can host an OS. It looks like an OS to the, to the it'll, sorry, it looks like a machine to an OS. You can boot an OS on it. And hence it has to emulate, if it's going to actually act as a, uh, a machine, it's got to emulate not just the instruction set, but all of the things attached to the instruction set, I.O. devices, if it's actually going to do anything useful. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Uh, and so in the, in the limit, um, if you have one of these, your uh, OS on your application can't tell it's running on a VM. It just thinks it's running on the hardware it was designed for. So system VMs, interestingly, predate language VMs. Um, and so, you know, the question begs the question, how did they come about? What, what caused the start of the virtual machine era? And we have to go back to the 50s to understand the landscape of computing at the time. Um, and uh, why this idea arose. So anyone here remember the 50s? <laughs> Just checking. OK. All right. Me neither. Um, so back then, computers were single user devices. So you had a machine. Um, it had, you know, it could run stuff. You wanted to run a program on it. The OS was kind of this big library that you linked against. It was a set of routines and facilities that were deemed to be useful for all programs. And so, um, you know, they became widespread in the 50s uh, and, and the term got invented. And the sorts of things that the OS did was it abstracted over devices so that the application didn't have to know the very detailed nitty gritty of the devices it was operating over. It, it provided libraries of things like you know, numerical routines um, if, um, that were useful to applications. And it would provide um, things like filing capability. Back then, typically tape rather than disk. Um, disks were becoming common, but tape was the more common storage medium. And uh, the OSs um, also typically provided uh, a batch job scheduling capability because these machines were hugely expensive. And so you wanted to keep it busy you could only run one thing at a time, and so the OS would provide the service of marshalling the I.O. devices that a job needed, running the job through, getting results. You know, typically it would read some input from tapes of some kind and print on printers, and when it was done, it would have to get thrown off the system and the next one brought in. And the idea was to make that throughput as efficient as possible so that these uh, machines 
uh, which were astronomically expensive, were, were fully utilized. Towards the end of the 60s, however, computing had got cheap enough and widespread enough that people wanted to provide time-sharing capabilities, so interactive computing for multiple users. Uh, and it had to be multiple users because the machines were too expensive to support a single user generally. You, you wanted to amortize the cost of the machine over, over many, many users at a time. And so there was a, this huge push to build time-sharing operating systems. And the, kind of the definitive one of the era was IBM System 360, which you can find documented in the literature in, in copious detail. And, and you know, a good place to start, if you don't know anything about it, is Fred Brooks, the myth Mythical Manual. So the idea of time sharing was to optimize the machine time, not the user time. People were cheap. Machines were expensive. You had to try and squeeze the maximum you could out of the cycles that were available. Um, and so the, one of the ways of doing this was that you, could, you did the computation. And, you know, one job would be doing I.O. The I.O. would um, pause activity. You could be running some other job while the I.O. was taking place. Interactive time sharing came later. Um, in 1962, uh, Manchester, <laughs> cheer, um, uh, the Atlas computer uh, was developed, and um, one of the innovations in Atlas was virtual memory. Um, prior to that time, people had programmed directly to the hardware address space of the machine, and as had happened in the late 50s and early 60s, many programs were too big to fit into memory. And so the programmer would have to manually swap bits of the code in and out, uh, typically from a drum, and uh, sort of hand swap things, which was, as you could imagine, sort of nightmarishly complicated. And so virtual memory was invented to make programming easier and to give people the ability to, to write programs using a much bigger conceptual address space and not have to manage the swapping by hand, that it would be done automatically and it was originally called one-level storage. Um, somewhere in the years that followed that, the word is, the term virtual memory got attached to the idea. I, I have not been able to locate where that happened, what, what the first use of virtual memory was, but I believe that the term virtual as in virtual memories were virtual machines, and that particular choice of word came from. Now, a funny thing happened around this time, which is um, one approach to building operating systems that was designed is the one that we're familiar with today. You boot the machine, it has a single operating system, and the OS virtualizes the hardware so that each user, each application, gets to see uh, an abstraction that looks like a machine but is actually uh, only a slice of the machine, either a slice in time or a slice in space. Um, but that was not the only way that people were thinking about doing time sharing at the time. In, in particular, system VMs arose from an alternative approach to time sharing, which was, let's keep the OS and the application single user, but we'll provide the capability to boot multiple OSs, each supporting a single user, and multiplex at that level on the machine so that people can run their work that way and can share the, share the hardware that way. Um, so every user in an application had, had a dedicated single user OS and, and every application and user could have a different OS if it really wanted to. So this is the, the kind of the architectural picture. You have your application coded to an instruction set and running on an OS and underneath that is a thing called a virtual machine monitor. Um, more recently, well, not long after that, the term hypervisor appeared. They're more or less synonyms, but uh, we won't go into that distinction. And these two instruction set architectures are essentially the same, right? The instructions at this level and instructions at that level are the same instructions. Uh, there might be tiny differences, and we can go into that, but, um, but these uh, application OS bundles are multiplexed on top of the very, very... Um, expensive hardware. And this, this originated because, you know, the computer time was expensive and you wanted to run everything you could. A typical installation had only one computer. And so um, if you wanted to switch to another application on another OS, 
you either rebooted the, you know, with a new OS when that application ran, but if you wanted to get this benefit of time sharing, you had to run multiple OSs simultaneously. So, um, in this picture, the contents of this box was called a virtual machine. So, the virtual machine was not software that ran the instances, they were the instances themselves. So, in this picture, there are two virtual machines, and, and the way to think of this is it's like a real machine, only, well, it's virtual, right? It's, it's um, um, you have one physical machine, but two virtual machines here, or potentially many of them. And the virtual machine monitor is the thing that mediates amongst all of these uh, application OS packages. So the virtual machine monitor was a relatively small and thin layer of software because these two instruction sets are either identical or extremely close to each other. And the intention was that the software provided, you know, didn't really get in the way when you were running the OS. It just managed resources and boundaries between them and, and did some amount of scheduling. Um, but when the actual application the OS was running, the virtual machine was more, the monitor was, was off to the side. So it maintained memory mappings, it did the scheduling, and it enforced partitioning of, of things like the physical resources, the memory and the devices. So, so you might have one OS would get access to a tape unit and the other OS you know, had no, no ability to access that. It would, it would manage those things. And from this, uh, you know, this was the era of job control language and the idea of um, when you ran a program, you stated which peripherals you were going to use at the beginning of the program, and, and those that your program didn't run until they were all available. So, why do it this way? From, you know, from our perspective now, this seems weird, right? Because at first sight, you think, hold on, we have machines with you know, so little memory that you know, a decent watch w would, would seem over-provisioned by comparison. And each of the applications comes with a copy of an OS. Um, you know, that seems incredibly expensive as a way of um, organizing things. But it, it solved an important problem, which is um, computers were expensive. You could only typically have one. And so how do you avoid downtime? You know, this is the era in which many uh, online applications were beginning to appear, flight reservation systems and things like that. How do you get 24 by 7 computation in a, in a system like in, a, in an instance where you have only a single machine? You can't reboot it because the service will go down during the reboot. So the idea was you had a virtual machine monitor that ran forever and you rebooted the individual OSs above, but there was always something available providing service. It was like, you know, the, the way you would now provision a system, have a new system provisioned, that, to take over from it and sort of switch, switch your service from one to the other at the point where you wanted to transition. That was all done on one machine at the time. It gives you a way of upgrading applications and OSs and still remaining in production. So if you look on your, on your um, chart, right at the top left, you will see CP40, which was the first sort of identifiably complete virtual machine monitor. Um, Implemented on System 360, um, it was not implemented on stock hardware. They had to do some um, some modifications to get it to run. Um, but it was sort of the ide first identifiable complete system VM. There was an experimental predecessor called M4444X, which you can find descriptions of, which was kind of close. It almost got there. But everybody seemed to agree it wasn't quite there, and, and CP40 was the first thing to get there. <laughs> Um, so the system itself could host, uh, it was running on an IBM 360, it could host 14 VMs, each of 256 kilobytes of virtual memory, and the physical memory was 128 kilobytes, uh, um, 32 4K pages. Like I say, you know, pretty poor if you have a watch these days that only has that. Um, and the address translation mechanism they needed to, to do this, they had to build and add in uh, to make this run. Interestingly enough, they had so much slack in the cycle time, they didn't need to extend the cycle time even by adding the direct translation. Well, that was kind of cute. There's a very good uh, 
uh, document documenting some of this earlier history that, uh, on the web. So the user model, as I said, was that each VM ran a single user, user OS, typically CMS, which uh, stands for Conversational Monitor System, and uh, it, the VM mediated job control. Uh, it did have uh, what we would call today para-virtualization, which is instructions at the VM level which were not exactly the same in semantics at the hardware level, but were used to communicate information down to the virtual machine monitor. We'll, get, we'll say more about that later. Uh, and originally, the reason they did this, they built, they built this, was to measure the behavior of non-virtual memory programs in a virtual memory environment, because around that time, thrashing had just been discovered, and, and no one knew what was causing it. There was serious misunderstanding and misconception as to the behavior of virtual memory systems. And the idea here was to, was to take applications that had already been written, multiplex them on a piece of hardware, uh, look at their behavior, you know, experiment with paging algorithms for the next generation. Um, and a lot of this was done in conjunction with MIT. MIT and IBM led all the early history in this, in this area. So things moved along. The 60s, the more implementations came along. Um, in the early 70s, System 370 was designed by IBM, um, which kind of embodied all of this stuff as standard practice. Uh, everything seemed to be fairly well understood. Uh, there's a paper on the chart, Hopper and Goldberg, called Formal Requirements for Virtualizable Third Generation Architectures. At that point, you know, sort of the academic world had come in and said, yeah, we I think we understand this. Here's some Greek um, to show our understanding. And the idea of, in this paper is that uh, your, your instructions have to compose in such a way that uh, either they do the right thing or if they're not going to do the right thing and expose details of the underlying hardware, there has to be a trap and the monitor can intervene. And most of the instruction set architectures at the time didn't meet that requirement. So it was sort of a big deal if you could do this without um, changing the ISA, and that was one of the design goals of System 370, was to have a, a virtualizable instruction set in the time when uh, few were. So, um, so they became commonplace, it became standard practice to use virtual machine monitors on mainframes and to have uh, system VMs running, and, and these things were, had a reliability to them which we can only uh, admire now, you know. I, I remember in the early 80s running into folks who were doing mainframe stuff in Manchester with ICL, you know, and it was perfectly normal that the VMM, the monitor, would never crash in the lifetime of the machine. Right? It was just like unheard of that the VMM crashed. You know, people got fired for that kind of thing. Uh, the OSs might crash, but the reliability of the system of the whole, as a whole through this composition was, was remarkable. And, and, you know, back then, um, hardware was slower and the silicon was bigger, so you didn't have failures due to bit flips, due to cosmic rays and things like that. They were, that was a much rarer phenomenon, too. So hardware was reliable and slow. And uh, the, this, this trick worked really well in terms of providing very reliable computing facilities for finance and airline reservations and, and all of these things which had then come to depend on computing for infrastructure. And then it all kind of went quiet. So big commercial success, research over, we're done, no fuss, no mess, you know, see hardly any papers in the academic literature. After that, it goes kind of quiet. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of the world, below the mainframe world, the mini-computer world and the microcomputer world that followed it, ignored this model and adopted the one that we are familiar today, which is there is a single OS and the virtualization is provided by the OS, which is fine until you want to reboot. Um, and the two worlds diverged, and we'll come back to the convergence in a little while. So this is a good point to poll for questions. Anyone? So are you, are you saying that we would be better off today with the old model? Well, we've kind of brought it back. Uh, and I'll explain what's going, how that's happened. Okay, so let's move on to the language VM world. <coughs> so as I said, a language VM is a process VM, language specific, 
presents the OS-like interface, usually created, invented at the same time as a language, typically. Not always, but typically. And has these language-specific concepts and semantics. And it's often a, a smaller jump from the language semantics to the VM interface than it would be to a hardware interface. Um, the corollary of that, of course, is that it's a larger jump for other languages, typically. Um, and the systems I'm going to look at on the broad sweep across your picture are these in this first section, uh, BCPL, Pascal, Smalltalk, Self, Java, and JavaScript, which will take us up to the turn of the millennium. So the first language with uh, something that's identifiably VM-ish is BCPL, <coughs> which stands for Basic Combined Programming Language which in itself begs many questions, but I'm not going there right now. Uh, Martin Richards said that he should have stood to Cambridge, but then someone used the UPL. And yeah, so, so if you look at the history, CPL sometimes is expanded to Cambridge plus London. <laughs> that was the combination. It started in Cambridge, and then London got involved. So anyway, you, you took me there, even though I wasn't. So it was conceived of, CPL was a much bigger, more complex language conceived of by Christopher Strachey at Cambridge in the 60s. Um, but it turned out that no one knew how to implement it. It was basically beyond the implementation ability of the time. And so Martin Richards uh, designed basic CPL as a systems language subset of CPL and wrote a compiler and... Uh, uh, what we would now, I think, call a virtual machine to sit below it, actually two of them. Um, and if you've heard, if you're familiar with the Richards benchmark, same guy. Um, so it was used at Cambridge for systems programming, building compilers and operating systems, and it was well known uh, to the designers of C and was a heavy influence on, on C. Um, the compiler um, emitted... Uh, a bytecode called O code, which could be translated to native machine code. And so that was kind of an IR, but that it looked like a virtual machine instruction set. Uh, it also had an option for input in a different bytecode set called Sint code, uh, which I assume is pronounced like that, but I'm not certain, which was a, 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 an instruction set designed for interpretation. Interestingly, they were not the same. They use two different instruction sets for those purposes. Um, if you want to read about them, they're still very well documented. Um, Martin Richards is still alive and has a web page uh, at Cambridge and actually still maintains the system. Um, I downloaded a copy of this user guide uh, for my course, and the last modification date on it was only last year. So, you know, he's, he's still doing stuff. Um, and you can find the chapter that describes the O-code abstract machine. It's a very simple abstract machine um, with a 10-page definition. Um, it's not obviously terribly language-oriented. It's kind of like a simple machine. There's memory, there's a stack, there's instructions. I guess you can see that the instructions are connected to the semantics of the operators in BCPL, so that that's the connection. But there isn't, there isn't anything terribly high-level in this in this interface. And the, and the main aim was to make the compiler porting easy, and that was achieved, because all you had to do to port the compiler was write a translator from this O code into, into your native instruction set, or an interpreter for the other one. Um, it did not have massive impact, however. BCPL, I don't think, was widely used outside of the UK. Maybe not even widely used outside of Cambridge. It's not really easy to tell at this point looking at the record. Uh, but that would be, an, that's kind of an open question as to how, how many people knew about this. Yes? I know that it was used by the BBC and by Ford. For um, applications. applications. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Because they all came back to Martin Richards 30 years later to tell, nobody knows how to write these. Right, okay. Before, so. Okay, that's good to know. How did you find out? <laughs> I'll see you at the bar. <laughs> okay. Um, the next language system 
in the list uh, is Pascal. And, and I think Pascal, I would describe as having much wider recognition, brand recognition and impact. Um, at least the PR was better, let's say. Um, so Pascal started uh, in a language by uh, Niklaus Wirth and others at ETH Zurich. And um, in their early implementations, they used uh, a similar approach to compiler portability in a system called P-code. Uh, and in fact, you can, in the books, you can find Pascal definitions of P-code. On the Wikipedia page of P-code, there's actually a listing of the interpreter. You know, it's only I know, 50 lines long or 100 lines long. It's very, very short and simple, like the O-code system. Um, it did, however, take off in a much bigger way in that it was, it was adopted in other people's products and deployed commercially with, with various variants through the late 70s and early 80s. So the University of California, San Diego in particular, uh, built a whole commercial language system for microcomputers called the P-System based on these ideas, which they released and was fairly widely used. You know, you could see it in advertised heavily and it was used for commercial applications. And uh, a bunch of hardware companies got interested in hardware implementations, yeah. So it was a Byte 19 article. Yes. Right, right. So it was it was well known, right? If you if you opened by, you saw adverts for it or you saw articles. It was it was very widely circulated, and a bunch of hardware companies um, tried to build various different kinds of hardware implementations. Some by microcoding uh, micro engines, and who knows what microcode is? Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going there. You'll have to look that one up. Um, <laughs> And uh, others, um, you know, various forms. Uh, I'm including in this Lilith, which was Vieth's uh, microcoded engine uh, for modular that was done later. But there was, there was a whole bunch of effort implementing this kind of simple stack machine, which was interpreted. Very simple implementation. There was no compilation. There was no translation from P code to machine code. It was just interpretation. And the hardware was kind of a hardware interpretation of the same. Uh, the same P code, but, but were very widely known and used. Uh, and I've included a bunch of references here, which you can take a look at from various systems and uh, other things. Um, I'm going to take a tiny little diversion here, though, into the notion of abstract machines. Uh, because I think, actually, in some ways, that would have been a better name for the field. Um, you know, if you look up the definition of abstract, it sort of seems to convey what we're trying to get from virtual machines a bit better than virtual, which has no real meaning in this area out of computer science. The closest I can think of is, is from optics. If you're familiar with the idea of a virtual image in optics, you know, something that you can see, but that has no, you can't project. Um, it, so I can imagine that that was an influence in the choice of the wor word virtual in, in virtual memory and hence in virtual machine. But in some sense, abstract might be better. And it's had a, a, a longer history. So if you go back, you know, orig the original abstract machine, of course, is the Turing machine, which is way off the left-hand side of that chart back in the 1930s. Um, but there are other abstract machines, like the SECD machine for lambda calculus. Um, but... Um, one of the reasons to maintain the description is that to practically run something, you need to make certain concrete decisions. Uh, you know, to run something, you have to pick an encoding. You can't just wave your hands and say there is an encoding. Someone has to actually pick one and, and make it and use it for translation and, and, um, okay, okay. and uh, interoperability and such. And so, um, you know, the, so, so, those decisions are typically not made in what's called an abstract machine. Most abstract machines say, you know, there is an instruction set and here are the names of the instructions but not the encodings, for example. So in some sense, most abstract machines are too abstract to be used practically without extra information being, uh, extra decisions being made. Um, and so, you know, where does that leave the term concrete abstract machine? Anyway, you know, it's too late now. Virtual machine is it and we're stuck with it. And, uh, and, and that's, where we're, um, that's where we're headed. Now, interestingly, there is an abstract machine 
uh, that did make all those decisions and became quite well known, which is the Warren abstract machine for Prolog, which dates from 83. Uh, I would actually call this a virtual machine by the current definition because it has made all of these decisions more or less. Uh, it looks fairly familiar in some aspects for, to uh, the virtual machines for other languages with a heap and a stack, but there are also as abstract structures uh, like the trail and the pushdown list, which are, which are related to Prolog's you know, unique semantics. Uh, and so you get a stack with environments, but there are also choice points, which other languages don't need. So it, it, it looks like a virtual machine for Prolog. And, um, and this was very widely adopted uh, in the 80s for Prolog. Okay, back on the main line. Can I get some more water? Um, so let's start with small talk, um, which did most of the, the running um, in the 80s. But we have to go back a little bit further to understand the history. So in 1969, Alan Kay did a, a, a PhD thesis um, where he described the future of portable personal computers. This is a sketch of a laptop from his thesis. And, you know, kids playing with it in the park in 1969. This is all kind of extrapolating from Moore's law and imagining what you could do with it. Sort of, you know, I was about as old as those children then. So that was, it was kind of amazing to think how far ahead he could see. Um, and uh, from there he went on to join Xerox Park in its early days and form what was called the Learning Research Group, which was the intention was to uh, take these ideas and build programming systems that would be, that would make these things real, uh, more concrete, and experiment with the ideas. Even though the hardware was still a long way away, they felt like they could do, they could do experimentation. And so they invented the Smalltalk language and the system in the early 70s, and it went through a number of uh, variants and designs. And the, the design point was to build a system that was capable of being used uh, by children to learn. This is a very good history of Xerox Park. Um, the point at which uh, it gets interesting from the virtual machine standpoint is uh, the 1976 version of Smalltalk, which ran on this machine, the Alto, uh, which was they called the interim Dynabook. Dynabook was that little laptop. So, so this is how small that, la that, that laptop was in 1976. Um, this had, you know, some fraction of a megabyte of memory and uh, a microcoded processor. And they built a Smalltalk implementation that was recognizably a virtual machine on top of this hardware, uh, running bitmap graphics uh, on the display, uh, an object-oriented language, uh, honed to do interactive computing uh, on, on this system. Uh, that was refined over the next years uh, with another major release occurring around 1980 called Smalltalk 80 and uh, running on a faster, bigger machine called the Dorado. And um, uh, a lot of effort was done into making the Smalltalk 80 VM on the Dorado really fast. And uh, those who have seen it, and I have some colleagues who have seen it, saw it back then say it was very, very impressive at the time. Um, in terms of uh, its impact on people, the responsiveness of the system and the quality of the implementation, the various qualities of the implementation. Uh, in 1981, the team at Xerox decided that they were going to do a, a, a wider release of the system. You have to think back to, uh, this was the days when software you know, you didn't put it on the web because there wasn't a web. Um, and uh, back then, maybe they could have put it on the internet, but it wasn't the standard thing to just push software out back then. You had, you had to make a big decision to do that. And so they did that. They got corporate approval to do that. And um, they released uh, some software and mainly documentation. So there was a special issue of Byte Magazine in 1981, uh, which documented some of the system and then um, uh, what's called the rainbow books that were produced in the next couple of years that describe the system and its implementation. Uh, the blue book on the left is the, is the important one for the purposes of this talk. Uh, in that book, uh, there was a reference implementation of the Smalltalk VM written in Smalltalk. So if, 
if you learned how to read small talk, you could read this definition and it would describe what the VM had to do and you could go off and implement it. And in fact, uh, you, you, you had two root, routes to getting a small talk system running was you either went to Xerox and you bought one of these machines, uh, which was no mean feat because I think the list price on the Dorado was something like $100,000, $1980. Not, 19, not 2016 dollars. Um, or you took the definition and you got, uh, you sent off and you got a tape which contained the objects that you were supposed to run on top of this machine and you built your own implementation by reading the book. Uh, and that's what I did for my master's thesis in 1984. Uh, so I built an implementation of Smalltalk. It's actually a very modest project. You know, it's a few months at most. You probably, you know, People today will probably do it much less than that. Um, and you implement an object memory and a bytecoded ISA via interpretation, and then you load up the information that you get on, off the tape, and it all comes to life, and the bitmap displays appear, and uh, cool stuff happens. Interestingly, in this system, uh, kind of everything's an object. You know, activation records are object, classes are object, the class of a class, which is a meta class, is an object. It's, it's sort of objects all the way down. And uh, here's my here's the scan of my copy of the release manual that came out uh, with the system. You can find this on my website. I've scanned it since then. Uh, unfortunately, I've lost the tape, but you know, where would you read a reel-to-reel -reel tape these days? Um, and, uh, and you can go on, you know, roll your own VM, or you can pick up mine, which, which still runs. And if you really want to see, oh, uh, it still runs, I can give you a demo afterwards. Um, but the important point in small talk history for our purposes was not any of that, although the definition and the release were certainly significant. The biggest landmark by far, I believe, is this paper from Peter Deutsch and Alan Schiffman, which appeared in uh, the January 84 pop-up describing their implementation of small talk 80 on uh, the on a 68,000 base workstation rather than a microcoded engine that was a precursor to the workstations like the Sun One that came out shortly thereafter. The performance of Smalltalk on the microcoded machine had been wonderful and everybody liked it, but nobody had the $100,000. Um, so one of the things they decided to do was to target the emerging microprocessor-based workstations that were coming out around that time with something that had similar kinds of performance but on much more affordable hardware. And to do that, rather than spending their time in microcode, which is kind of a fairly straight ahead way of implementing an interpreter, um, they had to come up with a lot of cleverness to be able to translate from the bytecodes of the small talk virtual machine into the instructions of the underlying 68,000. And this paper has all that stuff in you know, eight pages, I think it is. Here's my, my copy signed by the authors. Um, and um, it sort of sets a, you know, there's a before and after in virtual machine history that's defined by this paper. So this paper is really the first widely acknowledged, accepted implementation of just-in-time translation. We can split hairs a little bit about some of the precursor systems and whether they meet this step, but, but this is beyond doubt that this has, this is a just-in-time compiler and has many of the mechanisms that we would be familiar with today, so code caching and code lookup and dynamic translation. Um, so it was notable for that alone, but it had other ideas that have been adopted since then. Uh, inline caching of message send targets, uh, on-demand de conversion from, from a machine format to, a, to an abstract format and back again so that tricks that were going on under the cover wouldn't be noticed by the user who just thought they were dealing with objects. Um, implementation of a clever uh, reference counting scheme. Um, if you want to know, know about this, I had uh, the authors come and give a visit during my course for an entire afternoon and uh, talk about what they did, and I asked them lots of questions, and the students <coughs> asked them lots of questions, and the video is on YouTube. Um, it was a fantastic afternoon. I really, I think it's a high point uh, of uh, my recent career, certainly, is to host that event. 
and um, you learn a lot by watching that video, I think. And, uh, but turn the sound down for the last five minutes if you're around anybody else, or you might lose your job. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'll let you find out what that's about. So um, who knows what an inline cache is? Who doesn't know what an inline cache is? Okay, here's the one minute introduction to inline caching. Maybe two minutes. So the idea of an inline cache is uh, to provide an accelerated way to make what you would call a method invocation or a virtual function invocation. So you have the name of something you're trying to call uh, which has to be bound to a specific thing based on the runtime type of the thing you are invoking. Uh, and so in small talk, uh, let's say you're going to send the message f to a receiver p, or in sort of c-ish, or java-ish, you're going to invoke f on p. What you do is you compile or plant some code like this. It, it, in, it has a call site here for, for this thing. It puts in the code to compute the receiver, you know, the target of the invocation into one register. It puts in the code to compute the name of the uh, thing you're invoking in another register. Typically, that's just a simple load. And it calls a, a built-in, pre-built lookup routine. And what the lookup routine does is, uh, so the red thing is the program counter advancing. So we work down here. We end up in lookup routine. The lookup, the lookup routine is going to find the target that you have to invoke based on the types of the things in the registers and the values in the registers. So an A method, the native version of your method, is going to get associated with this particular pair of name and receiver. If necessary, in a just-in-time compiled environment, you build that by compiling. But anyway, at the end of, by the time you get to the bottom of this, you have it in your hand. There it is. There's the end method that you want to invoke. And then you're going to patch this call sign to refer to this end method. So this is self-modifying code, something for most people they were taught is a bad idea. You know, don't do that. It's a bad thing to do. But here, this, this technique depends on that idea. So I'm going to patch that call now to go to n0 henceforth. So what happens the next, and, and jump to it, and then we've completed the first invocation. Now the next time we get here, we're not going to go to the lookup routine, we're going into, straight into this end method, and the very first thing we do is we do a little test to see whether we went to the right place. Is this the right method for the new pair that we have the next time around? If it isn't, then we're going to go to lookup, redo that computation, generate maybe another piece of code, patch the call site to that, and invoke that. But if it's the right thing, then the invocations are very fast. Yes? So I did inline caches for Hotspot. I redid them later in life. I can have a lot of color. It's hard to get this right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to get it right, it's like two clock cycles instead of one for mm. a call. Um, Yes. And I can step people through how that works so that everyone else gets it right, but I don't, now's not a good time. Right. Maybe it's, later. It's, it's, there's, there's much subtlety to doing this properly. Much subtlety. Much subtlety. And in fact, what I gave you was the very simple yeah. overview in this animation. In the course, I spend nearly an hour on this topic alone. Um, yeah. so, so there's, there's much more to it. But it was a key invention, uh, not just for what it achieved, but for the, things that followed on in, in subsequent systems, and we'll get there. Okay, so I've listed a bunch of influences. I'm gonna skip that uh, and move right on to self. So self uh, was a language designed to succeed small talk, to be like small talk, only more so, even more simpler and more regular, uh, designed by Dave Unger and Randy Smith. Uh, in the 86, 87 time frame. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, David spent a lot of time working on Smalltalk VM implementations. So I had very strong ideas as to how to do VM design. And the self VM is only eight bytecodes, very small bytecoded instruction set. And uh, the work was done at Stanford, which is where Dave was, and Park, which is where Randy was for the first five years. And then they sort of got absorbed by Sun Labs. 
Smalltalk populated most of the 256 byte matrix, right, the 8-bit bytecode space. There might have been a handful of slots free, but there weren't many, if any. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about modern VMs like JVM as, you know, I don't know, a billion. <laughs> Kidding. Um, so, um, so Self took the next set of steps building on the um, Deutsch and Schiffman implementation uh, and brought uh, a lot of virtual machine technology very close to what we see uh, in VMs today. So it went from just-in-time translation, a one-off, do it just at the point where you're executing the code from the first time to doing a feedback-driven adaptive optimization. So you compile maybe once, but then you go back and you recompile and you do more and more optimization. And for that, you need both more compilation technology, but you also need the right information to drive the compilation decisions and do the right thing. Because if you try, uh, particularly in these dynamic languages, there's so little information in the source that if you just look at the source from a compilation standpoint, you'll never get really good code. It has to be the source in conjunction with the actual objects that it's running on to get really good speed. So here's the list of things that um, came from uh, self over, those peer over this period, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a road map to them. The very first implementations were done at Stanford. Uh, there are two theses, uh, early theses in the system, which are a good read. Uh, Elgin Lee's master's thesis uh, in 1988, which describes uh, a lot of the VM memory structure and implementation, the idea of a generational heap implemented in C++, uh, maps, which are an abstraction over classes, uh, which self didn't have classes, it was a prototype-based language, and so uh, getting class-like structure was part of the implementation, it wasn't there in the source. It had a particular clever C++ trick for mapping self objects onto C++ objects, which is still present in things like Hotspot and um, V8, and managed the dependencies between code generated at runtime. Talk had a data structure for that. Craig, meanwhile, focused on compilation and compiler optimizations, and came up with a number of different techniques to try and extract better performance uh, from the system, but, uh, but, and there is a caveat here, the performance was very uh, unpredictable. Uh, this system had to basically guess which optimizations to apply because it had no runtime data that it was using to drive the compilation. And so it would go down this long path of, I'm going to do this optimization and that optimization and that one. And if the stars aligned, uh, and it hit the, the jackpot, you got fantastic performance. But if it didn't, you had terrible performance and a huge long compile pause. Um, and, and that was the state of the system in, in 92. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip those. Um, so the sorts of techniques uh, he had were um, distinguishing between fast paths and slow paths and then splitting the code into a fast path and slow path case and compiling them independently. So that once you've assumed you're down a fast path, you can make optimizations based on that fast path, fast path assumption and specialize the code down there rather than, than having the generic code that would normally come after a merge. Um, there's a, a spectacular example which I have an animation for here, but I'm, I think I'm just going to skip it because I'm, there's no, otherwise I'm not going to get there to the right period of time. Let's see if I can figure out how to skip this slide without going through all the steps. Nope. <laughs> oh, I know, it's uh, that one. So this is a long chain of optimizations from one of Craig Chambers' papers where he starts with a very abstract method and it goes through all of the optimization steps and ends up with a very tight machine code loop for this example, which is, was far beyond the, what was achievable before it. Oh, come on. Anyone know what the shortcut in Keynote is to go to the next slide? There we go. All right. So um, the next system fixed that problem of unpredictability. And um, that was mostly due to Urs Hölzler's uh, work at Stanford, 
where he, he generalized the notion of inline caches to polymorphic inline caches and added counters associated with those uh, polymorphic inline caches to, uh, in effect, build a type and, and time profile of your program as it was running in its initial form and then use that data to feed back into the compilation system to generate more optimized code. So this was the, really the first the, the, uh, feedback-driven optimization uh, at runtime. Um, so let's uh, take a look at some of these ideas. So polymorphic inline caches, kind of like the other thing, except um, instead of having uh, patching uh, the call sign to just switch between different targets, you build a, a, a stub over time that captures all the things you've seen so far in a set of type tests and dispatch that goes through it. And you can see as this uh, builds up, uh, if you look at this structure, you'll be able to see which, which types you've seen up to that point in the execution. And uh, the other variant that they had in the system was that interposed in these uh, arcs in the early version was a counter that would count how many times you did any particular branch. And so you'd build up basically a type histogram um, that would tell you for each call type which type you'd seen how, and how often. Uh, the other clever trick, which perhaps was underappreciated at the time, was the idea of deoptimization. And um, the point here is, uh, some optimizations you want to do are speculative. You can't, you can't just do it and forget about it because it's based on assumptions that might change in the running of your program. Because dynamic languages, you know, the program can change in interesting ways over time. So um, the, uh, the, the notion here is you want to be able to do the optimization, however, record the dependence on the assumption and then be able to undo it later. From the point of view of changing the code, that's fairly straightforward. The difficulty is what if somebody's running that code at that time based on the optimizations? How do you get out of it? And here's a little example that illustrates the technique. Suppose we have a, f a set of methods which call each other. So we have M which has a couple of local variables and passes them as parameters to foo. Foo calls some other thing called bar, which is big and hairy and complex and not shown. And then it calls baz with those variables and all baz does is add them together and return the result. So uh, suppose that also that our compiler looks at this, has enough type information, says, oh, I can inline uh, foo into m and I can inline baz into foo and do all of the optimizations, and I end up with this. So I have an out-of-line call to bar, because that's big and hairy and complex, and we don't want to inline it, and the rest of it's just abstracted down to return of seven. Okay, so now we start running it. That's our inlining tree as recorded by the compiler. We have a frame for this new method, an optimized one, which calls bar. We call bar, bar calls something else. The stack wanders off to the right here, grows, and somewhere along this line, we change that method from p plus q to p times q. What do we do now? How do we get out of that? And this is what deoptimization solves. So what we do here is the deoptimizer will take this frame for the optimized code and replace it with the equivalent frames had he been interpreting the unoptimized code or executing an unoptimized compile of that method as if you had done that all along. And it has to do this in the middle of an existing stack. Uh, it doesn't actually do that, it cheats, but that doesn't matter. From an abstract point of view, what it's doing is replacing stack frames in the middle of an existing stack and it has to rewrite the, uh, the frame here so that it returns into the right place in this frame. And then the stack unwinds and goodness happens, and you never knew the optimization had taken place. So these, these deoptimization points were put into self because it's a dynamic, uh, interactive language, and people change the program as they're running. But it turned out to be a much more u widely useful technique than that. Uh, even in languages where you don't change the program while it's running, what you really want to do is you want to compile a version and be able to undo your compilation based on decisions that come later, and deoptimization has, has become a very big hammer. Uh, what's the effective? Okay, all right. And I'll skip the on-stack replacement slide. So we get to Java, JVM, 
came out in 95, killed self, dead in the water, <laughs> gun to the head, bang. Um, and then so, but suddenly Java was this hugely popular system and it was you know, full employment for virtual machine programmers. Um, massive influx of people. Um, so the JVM was based on sort of a familiar ideas, uh, added uh, class level distribution, sandboxing, static typing, various other things, and got massive adoption. And so suddenly VMs went from this niche thing, you know, the community of small talk and self-users was probably in the thousands or maybe tens of thousands at its best. Uh, and then suddenly it went to millions of people using them. Um, so the early JVMs were just playing catch up with small talk and self. Uh, many, many simple JIT compilers were written. Um, but the, um, the concurrency added some new challenges and opportunities. Uh, and then came along Hotspot. So Hotspot was implemented by one of the XSELF team at a startup um, and then brought back into Sun uh, with all of these capabilities that had come, well, I should say deopt, sorry for the autocorrect there, not depot. Um, and, then, um, and then it got hammered on um, for years and years and much, much, much more stuff was added. Fast locking and virtual table dispatch and many techniques and our good friend here is uh, responsible for the server compiler which brought sort of the traditional body of compiler literature and applied it into this thing because before this the only optimization that was done was inline really more or less. There was really nothing particularly sophisticated in compilation but now we had a system with enough use and enough programs which were important enough and uh, enough smart people that a, a big heavy duty optimizing thing could be built and applied and, and made, uh, made useful. And then since then there have been a whole bunch more optimizations added, escape analysis, uh, various concurrency techniques, compiler, uh, VM separation, uh, concurrent GC, extensive literature in this area. Say a little bit about VMs for small devices. So um, after the uh, wave of Java in the, on the desktop uh, came uh, cell phones and the desire to push virtual machine technology there. Uh, there were research projects attempting to build very small uh, implementations based on the earlier ideas, simple interpretation and such, and those uh, finally made, them out, made the way out the door uh, and um, through Spotless, which was a, a simple VM built at Sun Labs running on the Palm, which became the KV, KVM um, and went into many, many millions of cell phones and then was replaced by a hotspot-like VM um, for cell phones. Um, But paths from there uh, led to things like the uh, JVM that runs in Blu-ray players. You know, if you should click the About menu on the Blu-ray player, you'll see, you'll see there's Java in there. And if you ever had the original Kindle that had a, uh, one of these VMs in it as well. Uh, I, do, I really should mention the Microsoft CLO, uh, not because it had um, particularly different techniques or approaches, but it really tried to push on the idea of multilingual support from the beginning. Uh, I think was the first to do that, but I'm, I'm open to uh, data that would contradict that. I, I think it was the first, and, and this hosted a wide variety of languages. So let's go back to system VMs, which we left in the mid-70s. Um, and what had happened there was that, um, you know, they'd been adopted by mainframe users and quietly forgotten. Um, but a whole bunch of other things had happened in the 70s and early 80s that made them interesting. Uh, the first is that IBM pushed more on the idea of co-designed VMs and th this is the idea that you build your hardware with the intention that it's there to run a VM. Um, in the mid 80s, uh, uh, sorry, the early, uh, late 70s, System 38 came out which was a, a mainframe system in which the instruction set that compilers targeted was not the hardware instruction set, it was a different instruction set Applications got distributed in this virtual ISA and then the OS uh, did the compilation and the, tr the translation into the machine code uh, almost transparently, certainly opaquely. And that, that system evolved into a product line which is still going today. Um, 
many, many mainframes were built based on this idea of objects and translation. But meanwhile, uh, in the micro world, uh, in the 90s, um, things changed in that you had micros had proliferated. Uh, they were in everybody's computer at that point, other than the handful of mainframes that were out there. And suddenly you had data centers full of these boxes running applications, most of which were idle. Now, why were they idle? Well, because of the dirty secret of computing. What's the dirty secret of computing? The, the lack of thereof. The, the dirty secret of computing is that uh, when you build something, you test and uh, validate a specific configuration of every single package, you know, software component. And, and only that do you validate, right? You don't generalize and say, you know, if I validate this and I validate that and I validate any product, any combination will work right. We don't actually do that in practice. We validate only specific configurations. And so in a data center running single application OSs, there's a huge proliferation of systems with, you know, slightly different ver versions of everything that all have to run independently. So you end up with uh, data centers with very large numbers of machines, very much underutilized. And along came VMware that said, we can solve that problem for you. Put a system VM below your application and you can multiplex your applications on machines and do load balancing and uh, elastic migration. And, uh, and we'll take a slice of the money that, you pay, that you've saved on your hardware. And that was extremely popular. Right? And what that's translated into is, um, well, we'll get to it, but it's really the basis of cloud. So, um, interest of time, I think I'm going to skip the binary translator. And the hosted VMs with the cool animation. And transmitter and go right to now. Uh, so these VMs became deployed very widely. Paravirtualization was picked up again, the idea that your VM interface is not exactly the same as your hardware interface. You can abstract over things like devices and you can provide hints to the underlying scheduler. Zen is the system that, uh, that promulgated that. I highly recommend this paper if you've not seen it. And uh, finally, in the mid-2000s, the hardware uh, folks realized that they had to support this directly on their chips, and so both Intel and AMD uh, built in support for system virtualization directly. Other ISAs had already say, taken that step or had, were just about to. So the mainframes had had it forever, and it finally arrived in most of the other systems. And, uh, you know, the cloud, cloud is the killer app of a system VM, right? You want, you want to have this elastic uh, capability of building systems and deploying them independently without them uh, interfering with each other and the system VM gives you that capability. So EC2 is based on Zen, um, you know, and now we've got to the state that system virtualization is so important that people want to virtualize below the existing virtualization layer. So you, you build an application that you know you're going to deploy on VMware, but how do you deploy that in Amazon's cloud which is based on Zen? Well, you put another virtualization layer in the middle. Uh, so-called nested virtualization. Mentioned in 74 in the Popek and Goldberg paper, finally, it's a business. Uh, Haswell has introduced the hardware support to make this possible. Oracle just paid half a billion bucks, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Um, that's a press story. That's not an official statement. Um, for Avello, which provides nested virtualization capability. Suddenly, this is the big thing. Okay. I'm going to skip that, and then we'll end with language VMs to the present day. So, um, Java came along, VMs became popular, everybody used a VM. What about the other languages? Uh, in the mid-2000s, we got um, wars around JavaScript performance. JavaScript was the de facto, still is the de facto language of the web. When web applications became a thing, then high-speed JavaScript had to come along, and so there were battles between various companies to build fast JavaScript VMs. Um, TraceMonkey brought trace compilation to the system. I wish I had had time to explain that, but I'm running out of time. Uh, Google took the self approach and the hotspot approach to build a V8, and Apple did its own thing. 
uh, so trace compilation is important in that um, instead of compiling a method at a time, you, you compile traces. So you monitor what's being executed. A trace can span multiple methods. You observe the, the common traces and you compile them. Uh, they're easy to compile because they're linear. You get inlining for free because the trace is uh, free because the traces span call boundaries. Um, there's a landmark paper that describes this and an earlier paper which is in the slides I skipped on the, its origins in binary translation. Um, since then, and the current focus of work, for those of you doing research, seems to be making VMs easier to build. So, um, using higher level languages so that we don't have to struggle with C and C++ quite so much, um, building metacircular VMs so we can get to re reuse large chunks of the system and have a much more modular system, and then the current uh, hot contenders for VM construction, which are metatracing and partial evaluation, which I think are, I will describe those and wrap. Uh, so I won't harp on C and C++ right now. Or why it's a, you should do it in a higher level language. We'll go straight to metatracing. Oh no, another animation. <laughs> Pretty, aren't they though? Jikes is another thing to look at on Landmark that had a lot of influence. And so the, the motivation for making them easier to build is because you want VMs to apply to a wide variety of languages. Now, if you, uh, if you look at how much effort has been put into building some of these things, you know, a simple JIT and a simple VM's, you know, kind of person year effort, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. You know, the self VM was, um, was perhaps an order of magnitude above that. And the hotspot VM, I, I'm sure there's you know, many hundreds of person years in the hotspot VM. It's just a staggering amount of work. And you don't want to do that for every single language that's out there. You want to be able to reuse uh, stuff. So um, that's the animation again. So the result of that was this situation a few years ago where a handful of languages had great performance because they'd have the effort applied or the static languages, C and C++. So if you take C and C++ as measures of how fast things can be, then Java and JavaScript were in the ballpark, and these are the languages were way out. This is a few years old, and, and notice it's a logarithmic scale, it's not a linear scale. So how do, we, how do you deal with all of these things without applying hundreds of man years to each? Uh, and, and so the, the key question is, how do you build a language-independent VM framework in which you can implement many languages more or less easily? So, um, Number one is metatracing, and the idea here is um, express the language semantics as a bytecode interpreter in a relatively high-level language, and then trace not the interpreter, but the high-level behavior running on top of the interpreter, and combine that with the semantics of the interpreter to generate machine code. Uh, and with some hints and optimizations, you can do pretty well. Uh, the, the leading contender for this is PyPy, which uh, Carl, there is, uh, is behind, um, originally a Python VM, and uh, but can be used to, has been used to implement many, many different languages now, Python, Ruby, Prolog, PHP, and others. And there's a very nice paper which you should read describing the technique. That's one way of going. The other way is the way we're, we're proceeding with uh, Oracle Labs, which is uh, build an AST interpreter in a relatively high level language, and then use uh, partial evaluation of that. So take the, take the abstract syntax trees of the guest application and the interpreter semantics and combine them to generate code. And again, I'm out of time, so I can't run the examples. You can see all of this on YouTube if you really want. I think we'll have a more detailed video on the video. Okay. Uh, still haven't found the modifier thing. <laughs> Pressing randomly. <laughs> okay. So the idea here is that by partially evaluating the, the interpreter, you get a compiler. So you write a partial evaluator, which is really a compiler, and you write an interpreter in a high-level language, and you combine the two, 
and you can compile the language. And when you need a new language, you write a new interpreter, but you don't need a new partial evaluator. Uh, and that's where all the effort goes. Um, there's much more to it than that, but I will leave it at that. And talk a little bit about Which? Shift and page up and down. There we go. So, um, in summary, there's the taxonomy I've used from Smith and Nair, process VM, system VMs. You can kind of map everything in that world, um, classify what you're doing in that. I've tried to give some of a taste of all of those. Um, there are good reasons for using VMs mainly portability, some, uh, some decoupling of guests from host is really the, the main proposition, but you get all these other things that flow uh, from those properties. And uh, one of the interesting things I think in building this timeline is the um, noticing the interaction of, between the technologies of system and language VMs in the recent decades. Uh, in, when I entered the field, th th they were sort of completely independent. Nobody talked about both kinds of things in the same breath. But then in the 90s, um, dynamic cogeneration techniques flowed from language VMs into system VMs, and then tracing flowed back into language VMs. And now there's a, a common language of implementation techniques that's used within those systems. What's the future? Well, multilingual support definitely seems to be coming. We have a couple of comp contending approaches for that. Uh, as um, it gets easier to build VMs. I think further proliferation is inevitable. In fact, uh, what, one of my main motivations for trying to make VMs easier to build is we need new, better languages, right? We haven't really had any new good languages, very few new good languages in the last 20 years. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason for that is it's very hard to make a high-performance thing uh, without investing massive effort. And the same goes for DSL. Um, if we go down that path, then maybe we'll have um, more high-performance, good languages available. Um, one interesting thing is the tension between uh, what you might call scale-out versus scale-up, or VM scaling versus hardware scaling. You know, we, we long ago got left behind by hardware in that there's hardly any VMs out there that can use all of a big machine. Um, Cliff might agree, disagree. <laughs> Maybe there's one VM that can use all of a big machine. <laughs> but in general, the VM technology and the implementation techniques don't scale very well to hardware. But hardware is, in some ways, getting smaller again as concurrency becomes ubiquitous. So, so maybe that doesn't matter. Or maybe they will meet in the middle at some interesting point. And then there's um, always this constant tension uh, between providing a single OS and virtual services and uh, uh, system VM providing OS services. Uh, Docker is a good example of the move in the opposite direction away from system VMs. So I will leave you with those thoughts. Uh, thanks to all those who commented on material and uh, of course to my Berkeley students who had to sit through 40 hours of this, but it was a lot slower. <laughs> slower. And I'll take any further questions. <laughs>